business uh, from now on and for today and uh, tomorrow all day we're going to do serious business. Uh, when we thought about uh, organizing a small uh, colloquium in Sinaya, uh, we thought I thought of a small format to allow for serious discussion between well-informed, intelligent people based on presentations uh, that will be also videotaped and uh, archived and distributed to whoever in the universe uh, via YouTube in the future. So uh, the idea was, I think, quite plain to all of us that it would be a good idea to talk simultaneously about topics that are somehow floating in there. Uh, Utopia, we discussed the five, first 500 years of Moore's posterity with the, his work, Utopia, discussed it last year, discussed it goes on. Uh, this year, the focus of attention is on 1917. Uh, I don't have to go into any details about why 1917 is such a big date. And of course, uh, next year, most likely, the first two centuries since the, ninth, the, the birth of Marx, uh, and then uh, also around the anniversary of the Romanist Manifesto, are likely to bring up uh, old memories, <laughs> in big case, revive old passions, but also maybe uh, uh, ignite a certain discussion about what brings us all here uh, together, namely the basic, uh, 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 the foundations of political thought, of political ideologies, of uh, speculative fictions related to politics and the good society, or the ways in which, the best ways in which good or bad societies can be wrecked and devastated. Uh, and this is uh, why we start uh, this evening at the conference, uh, the colloquium, the Royal Colloquium, the Colloquium of Revolution, with a, a presentation by uh, our colleague and friend, uh, Gregory Clays from Royal Holloway, London, who's going to talk to us uh, about utopia and revolution and Marx, the case of France. Yeah, you have Thank you very kindly. I'm unaccustomed to giving pleasure before business, so I have to say it's been a great pleasure, but we hope the business will be a pleasure as well. Thank you so much for the invitation, first of all, again. So I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, let me plunge straight in. I think actually I will stand just so that you have a chance to uh, hear me a little bit better. As we just heard, the years 15, 16, 1818, 1917 gave us a conjunction of three great events. The publication of the Thomas Logic of Utopia, the birth of Karl Marx, and of course, 1917, the Bolshevik. I only just started the Bolshevik Revolution. I want to consider this afternoon the connections, of course, there are a great many more not considered between these three events. And I want to do so by First of all, just starting with the composition, which is going to have to take pretty much on faith rather than by virtue of the argument I often use because the time doesn't go into great length about it. Namely, that what Utopia presents is a theory of social Most of the long is the range of the development of the tradition from creating societies where people are kinder, nicer, and more friendly to one another. So I'm taking that as a core definition to start with. I then want to look at what Marx has to say about this proposition and why uh, briefly we should treat Marx as a utopian and I then want to turn into the Bolshevik Revolution and ask a little bit about why this doesn't work out just in the way of Marx anticipated it would. So we start with the principle then that utopia constitutes something which I call enhanced sociability. The idea of designing better societies from inside a society in which people are unhappy 
is that they make their relationships with one another better than the relationships with society in the society they're living in have somehow deteriorated. There is a market, of course, increase in utopian thinking in the modern period for exactly this reason. Now, I leave aside the much vexed question today, which I've treated at length in my book about the dystopian, uh, which, while well, this copy is not for sale, there's a brochure here in case anybody wants to buy a copy of 30% discount for the ridiculous price that the publishers put up. Uh, there is a very long standing argument about the relationship between the utopian and the I turn to this at the end today, but I have much more to say about it in this fat book. So uh, let me turn then to Marx. We start out with the proposition utopia represents an enhanced form of sociability. We recognize it throughout the 500 year tradition, or the long start of the earlier 400 years of it, that there are many routes anticipated to making people warmer and friendlier and kinder towards one another, utopian mode. Not just one, but many. Some more successful than others, and some without doubt extremely successful. Others, of course, colossal failures. Let me turn then to Marx and ask how far his system sought to promote just such an ideal of sociability. To call Marx a utopians, I think we're all aware of this uh, circumstance, flies, of course, in the face of conventional terminology. In distancing himself between 1844 and 48 from his socialist predecessors, Marx categorizes utopians those who failed to see the proletariat as the prospective agent of transformation and dreamt instead of duodecimal petitions of the New Jerusalem rather than envisioning capitalism's violent overthrow. The traditional story here, I'm assuming, is known to all of you. Marx begins his career as a radical humanist when his thoughts on the subject begin to gel in 1843, 1844. He adopts Ludwig Feuerbach's conception of species being, rational reason, to describe the ideal of harmony that he aims at, and uses in a classic Hegelian uh, way the idealist proposition that the best society is formed around the concept of species being as the critical standpoint, for example, in the society in which he lives, which of course comes off extremely badly by the judgment of a society formed according to the idea of species being. Even exchange for Marx in this period was to be equivalent, I'm quoting here, to species activity and species spirit, the real conscious and true of existence, which is social activity and social enjoyment. So then, of course, in 1845 46, Marx drops this proposition in favor of an anti idealist perspective, which envisions the social relations of the future as growing out of the present. At various later points, he still stresses his distance from the utopians. Famously, with respect to the Paris Commune, uh, Marx says, the workers have no ready men utopias to introduce power, they have no they have no ideas to realize, but to set free elements of the new society with which the old collapsing bourgeois society itself is pregnant. Now, this narrative has been long suspect. I think yeah, most people recognize it as such today, unless you're on the inside of this camp. Not only did Marx continue to admire much about the early socialists, particularly Robert Owen's team of cooperation in the theory of education, and Charles Follier's insistence on overcoming narrow specialization, he also upheld in later life the ideal he had fixed on by 1844 as the end point of the revolutionary process, namely creating a society which would nurture an all-rounded concept of the character. This idea of all-roundedness serves in Marx as an end point of the process of social development, both before 1845 and throughout the rest of his life until his death in 1883. So it's important to stress this because of all the uh, misdirection, I think, of Marx's interpretation led both by Marx himself and by most other subsequent commentators. Marx continues to have an ideal then, an ideal that is defined by both all round development and a solid solidarity, the solidarity in the original, between individuals which is growing out of the process 
of the division of labor in large-scale uh, in industrial factories in particular. So, solidarity and all roundness then, uh, finish this point, remain as much as I can use, both in the earlier and the later writings. The Goodness and Capital promote solidarity, cooperation, the society of free producers, self-actualization, and all roundness. If utopianism consists in aspiring towards a society defined by enhanced sociability, then Marx clearly fits the definition. In the 1860s, however, Marx still denies that he's a utopian. What he meant now, however, was that producer cooperation, factories managed by workers, was emerging within capitalism as a model of future economic relations. This proved, Marx says, that production was possible, quote, without the existence of the class of masters employing their class of hands. Cooperation was now, this is a key point to the interpretation of Marx's mature uh, econ so called economic writings between 57 and 67. Uh, cooperation is now the bridge between the old capitalist society and communism, where democracy goes beyond politics to economics. Now, what this implies, incidentally, the footnote is that Marx becomes a more radical Democrat later on in life than he is even earlier, which is perhaps a surprising point. So let me turn now then very briefly to summarize seven basic ways in which we still want to read Marx as he told you today. So, and I'm using the term here in a neutral, obviously not in a pejorative or negative sense. And I'll just summarize these fairly briefly, although a couple of them are much more important than the others. The first and most obvious is that Marx positions himself relatively early on with the position associated with Thomas More. This is utopia in the sense in which More paradigmatically argues that communism is necessary as the structural set of relationships which makes what I'm calling enhanced sociability possible. And that with private property, such bond, close bonds of intimacy, friendship, trust, uh, solidarity will not be possible. This is the crucial core assumption of the utopian tradition, remains there throughout the most, but not by any means all, of the writers in the subsequent four or five hundred years after Thomas More. The second is Marx's persistent hostility to specialization. Now, this is the great, quintessentially Marxian. Not Marx is, but Marxian theme. John Elster, for example, well known commentator here, says that one of Marx's more utopian ideas is that under communism there will be no more specialist occupations. Thus, no more painters, only people who use other things paint. Mm -hmm. Marx and Engels, of course, famously, evidently, as the text is corrupted, defer to Fourier in portraying the future communist society in a well known as one in which, quote, nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each one can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. Society regulates the general production, thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, beer, cattle in the evening, without becoming ever a hunter, fishing, shepherd, or critic. Now, a crucial question, of course, is how far Marx maintains this perspective. If you think the older, more so-called mature Marx is extremely different from the younger, you generally disregard these statements in any case. But there is plenty of evidence that this is the case. This leaves us with a central problem, of course, if overcoming specialization is the key core, supersession or abolition, it's usually called the division of labor, is the core of Marx's vision of the future then we end up not only coincidentally and curiously with the society which Marx didn't think he could live in himself, and he probably couldn't have. If Marx it would have made a very poor shepherd, as he said. Uh, Marx was a specialist in critical criticism. So the after dinner stuff, he's fine here. But all the rest of it, Marx himself admits in a very candid moment, he can't see himself living in the future society. And we want to ask ourselves, too, that as the plane lands, do we want a pilot whose true love is garden? Or who came first in the Marxian theory <coughs> exam? As a frequent flyer, I have a strong opinion on this particular matter. Thirdly, then, there's the question of politics. Of 
course, famously, uh, after the transitional period of the dictatorship of the proletariat, politics, in the sense of class-driven antagonism, disappears in the future. We're all, sadly, too aware that this uh, simply shoves under the carpet all of the problems of contention which do emanate from class, but which might emanate from factionism, from sections, from ethnicity, from nation, from gender, from a hundred different sources of antagonism which don't disappear, even presuming the class disappears, of course. So this is uh, an extremely important point. So I'm going to skip over those of the most, uh, uh, besides the ideal of communist society, which I just kind of described here, the most important of these themes. Now, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, of course, famously does not bring to fruition Marx's as ideas. There are a number of different schools of thought as to why this is the case. And I have to say, I'm tending to the view that, by and large, Lenin never was a sufficiently democratic theorist or thinker or democratically minded, even from the point of view of his human character, to have made it likely that even had the circumstances of the revolution been different, the outcome would have been the outcome that Marx was looking for, both before the Paris Commune and after. But that's just a suggestion. It's, I can't defend it here. So we have five turning points within the revolution, clearly, where uh, the prospect, small as I just said, as it might have been, of the revolution becoming a radical democratic expression from below of an entirely new form of both democratic theory and democratic practice. Now, I tend to agree that I think Marx, as a radical democrat, was looking for an expression of democracy which he thought was much more democratic than any liberal society presented in his own time. Now, I don't doubt that Lenin shared this assumption with him. Lenin also thought that the USSR, that was just become shortly after the revolution, was more democratic. But what he meant by this was something completely different from what Marx meant by it. If a society composed of workers, now universally, was represented by a very small body who were mostly themselves also workers, that theory of representation for them did not require the elaborate mechanisms of the generation of power from below that Marx assumed that it did. That's the crucial distinction between the two. So the five points are, first of all, of course, most obviously the Bolshevik coup in October 1917, which ends the provisional government and ends the possibility of multi-party democracy, which includes so-called bourgeois uh, parties. Then, Lenin crushes opposition, of course, within his own party, and from other parties, principally here, the Mensheviks, the Social Revolutionaries, and the Anarchists, as well as, of course, uh, other independent bases of power, especially the trades unions and the cooperatives. So Marxist scheme here goes right out the window. The cooperatives were to form the, and the Paris Commune model still indicates this, were to form the foundation for the exercise of social and economic power. This model was crushed relatively early on, certainly by uh, 1929. Thirdly, then comes the assumption that the party, rather than the proletariat assembled in Soviets alone, represents the forward movement of the revolution. Now, of course, uh, the idea of Soviet power is at the core of the rhetoric of the Bolshevik Revolution. This means the power of assembled workers, after all. Is it the case that Lenin never really meant this to be the outcome of the revolution? There is, this is the classic problem with Marx now and Marxism. The theorization of the relationship between the Communist Party, the capital C, capital P, and other centers of power, government, economic administration, so on. Theorization of these relations is not adequately fleshed out, but certainly not in the writings of the Paris Commune, which is where we most expect it to be fleshed out. So some very crucial problems are left out of the formula, and it's in this uh, theoretical vacuum that that in the Russians in. Fourthly, then, follows Lenin's personal dictatorship, which is uh, there in the last couple 
of years at this time. And finally, of course, the police state emerges with the JKS assumption of power within, outside, and above the party. For most, this is the very worst uh, possible state of all. So let me conclude here by returning to the question as to what utopia has to do with this question. And uh, you showed Marx's utopia in particular. Marx is, of course, also accused of utopianism in the most negative sense. Not the senses in which I outlined earlier, but for example, in the shape of Kolodowski's accusation that Marxist system is utopian because it is based on competing values of freedom and social unity. The usual argument here that's presented, which can take us right back to Thomas More, without doubt, is that if you desire a society which is harmonious, you must have harmony of opinion. In order to have harmony of opinion, you have to suppress opposition and dissent. In order to do this, eventually, sooner or later, and it's rather sooner in the post case, later, you crush the opposition. And you end up with one opinion, but it's under the thumb of the Cheka. And so what have you done? To return to my opening comment, but of course, in seeking what seems to be the quasi-utopian end, you have created a dystopian by ensuring dystopian means to the dystopian end. Now, Stalin, I'm paraphrasing it, of course, in circumstances, uh, Stalin calls this dialectics, uh, but he uses this expression in describing the fact that a much greater, more powerful state was necessary to achieve the abolition of the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's dialectics, though, I'm going to wrap But there you go, there we have one paradoxes uh, in this entire system. So the greatest disasters accompany the implementation of Marxist vision, which accompany it, come, of course, from the extreme pace of modernization, which it implies, firstly. And then secondly, from the attitude towards opposition, which Lenin and others assume the dictatorship of the proletariat required, but as I've just suggested, which can be in a certain Kolokovsky's interpretation of certain other uh, writers can be seen as intrinsic to the utopian tradition. This, I think, is, if not the big question, is certainly one of the big five that we have to think about here. The inevitability or the necessity or the interconnectedness uh, of the several projects. Utopianism being covering a huge multitude of possible experiments, not certainly only this. In aspiring to industrialize rapidly, however, it's certainly clear that Lenin and even more Stalin chose the fast track to utopia. Much of the damage which results derives from their attitude towards the peasantry and the extremely punitive nature of agricultural collectivization in the 20s, early 30s, and especially the anti kulak campaign. The old Mauryan theme of transparency and mutual supervision of the Moors utopia, also produced a society in which trust was rare and suspicion the norm. Such means were therefore never likely to produce utopian ends. The high solidarity that the young Marx aimed at, while also realized to some degree in the ethos of party membership, the idealism of the Komsomols and so on, remained elusive in the wider society. Had plenty and even superfluity been achieved, the story might have been different. And this, of course, was the great gamble which the communists embarked on right up to the very last minute. If we can achieve in our standard of living a higher level than the West has achieved, we've won an entire gamble, including the millions of deaths from the anti Kulak campaigns, the Kulak, and so on. But they weren't achieved. And Sadly, that's one of the major reasons for the failure of this Thank you.